Welcome to Recovered Truths. My name is Greg Reeser, the pastor here at Crosswork Bible Church. We invite you to come join us. Uh, we're currently meeting at the Holiday Inn Express, uh, their conference room at 1000 Vandalay Drive here in Frankfort, Kentucky. We're on the west side of Frankfort. Uh, plenty of seating, so come back, uh, come, come join us in person. And uh, make sure you bring a King James Bible, a pen, and a piece of paper and study with us as we study God's Word, God's Way. And uh, if you've been with us for, for a short period of time, uh, hopefully you know that we do meet at 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings uh, with fellowship, and by 10.30 we get on with the service. And uh, as we've been going through here recently, we've been going through the book of Romans, right? Uh, we, we've talked about in the, in the fact that the first five chapters... 1 through 5, God deals with our justification. All right? He talks about the fact that we are lost and we need to be saved. And that we can, by conscious decision of our own free will, choose to accept the payment that God set forth to be a propitiation that the cross of Christ and the blood that He shed there is enough to keep us out of hell if we, by simple faith, believe that to be true for us. In Romans chapter 4, he tells us that believing is not a work. He says, but to him that worketh not, but believeth. All right? That tells us that believing is not a work. And in chapter 5, he talks about the fact that now that you have justification, we have peace with God. And that's a judicial peace that we're no longer ever going to be held to the judgment of God. We don't have to fear His wrath. We don't have to fear His anger. All we have to worry about is the grace and peace. In fact, we talked about that before. That's God's official stance today is grace and peace, not war and judgment and wrath. So then we get to Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8, and we're right here in the middle of 6, 7, and 8. And in the, this section, we talk about our sanctification. All right, which really comes out of our identification with Christ. All right, so in Romans chapter 6, we talked about the fact that we are free from sin. All right, that doesn't mean that we no longer sin. What that means is, is we're free from the dominion of sin. Sin no longer has control over us. And if we sin, it's because we choose to do so. You know, years ago, the, the saying was, well, the devil made me do it. All right, Some of you all probably watching know what that reference is. And a lot of people say, well, the reason I did that is because the devil made me do it. Well, then you got other folks that come along and they'll say, well, since God has preordained everything in the world, God is the one that made you sin. Well, none of those are true. The reason you sinned is because you chose to. Now, before you got saved, you sinned because that was your nature. Well, what happened is we found out that your, your old man is dead. He's crucified with Christ. And now you have these members, your body, that in your flesh dwelleth no good thing. And what that flesh is going to do is going to go do some sin. But you have the opportunity to say, I'm not going to do that. Because sin no longer has dominion over me because I am free from it. And in Romans chapter 7 that we've been dealing with here is we're free from the law. And that's where, we've, that's where we stopped off and we're going to spend a little bit of time on that today. And then in Romans chapter 8 we're going to find out that we're free from the flesh. Alright, so those three things. We're free from the law, we're free from sin, and we're free from flesh. You don't have to do the things that your flesh wants to do. You, by a conscious decision, have the ability to say, Flesh, I don't want you to do this, I want you to go do this instead. And that's a powerful place to be. And the only way we can do that is through the power of God working in and through us. Now that's not some, you know, strike me down type power. That's the Word of God. Paul talks about the fact that his gospel in Romans chapter 1, it says it's the power of God to salvation. That gospel, the words, the words on the page, where the Word of the Lord, where the Word of the King is, there is power. The Word is the issue. 
allowing God's Word to work in and through you. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 2, verse 13 talks about the fact that how they receive the Word as it is in truth, the Word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. The problem is, we don't believe the words. And that's what it comes down to. And that's why we most usually have problems in life is because we don't realize we're free from sin. The majority of the time is because we're not told. But a question, do you have a King James Bible? Yes. If you don't, let us know. We'll get you one. Absolutely free of charge. Are you, you can read Romans chapter 6 and find out for yourself. You don't have to listen to the pastor. You don't even have to listen to me. Go read the book. Paul says over in Ephesians chapter 3, he says, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. All you have to do is just get the King James Bible and read it. And then it's up to you to believe it, whether you believe it or not. And Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6, he says, know, reckon, and yield. That's the issue. What is it that we know that we are in Christ? What do we do? We reckon that we're free from sin. And then we yield our members, not as members, not as instruments of unrighteousness, but rather we had the free will choice to have our members be instruments of righteousness rather than unrighteousness. And again, that's a powerful place to be. And again, it's not you doing it. It's God's Word. That's the issue. Not only that, but it's God's Word working in and through you to produce that life when you believe it. Now we've left off the last time in Romans chapter 7. We got down to Romans chapter 7 verse 5. Now notice he says, and again, we don't really want to go through this verse by verse. We didn't really go through Romans 6 verse by verse, and we did in the first five chapters. Uh, our, our purpose here isn't to do this. We've already done this in our local assembly. This is for your benefit. We want to produce these videos for those folks that are watching and willing to pay attention to what's being said and going and studying for themselves. We've talked about it before, be a Berean. Right? Go and search those things daily. It's a daily intake of proper, sound doctrine. Well, what's sound doctrine? It's the information that was committed to and through the Apostle Paul. Now, that's a completely different study, and we can talk about that sometime, and we'll get to that. But there's some things that we need to make sure that we know and understand. When we got down to verse 5, he talks about, says, For when we were in the flesh... And that was before we got saved. So, here we are. We're either going to live by flesh or spirit. And so what he's setting up here says, flesh is who you used to be. Spirit is who you are now. Notice, for when we were in the flesh... Notice, the motions of sins. Do you know what the flesh is going to do? You have motion. You notice, that's one letter away from emotion. He talks about the motions of sins. How often are we allowing the, motion, the emotions to rule our lives rather than the truth. You know, you often think <clears throat> most churches today you take a look you take a look at the world around us and you see all the stuff that's going on and all the churches are saying, "Hey, come to us. We're just like the world except we've got a different a different book that we go by." That's the last place you should go. We shouldn't look for things that are going to appeal to emotion. Now, does that mean emotions are bad? No. Emotion is good. But are you living your life based on emotion or are you living your life to the point where it produces some emotions? 
We shouldn't be ruled by our emotions. And that's what he's dealing with here. He's talking about the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. And do you know what that did? That those, those motions of sin produced death. How was it that that, that 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 was produced is through the what? The law. We've already found out in Romans chapter 3 that the law was only there to show you that you were a sinner. And by the way, that is the only proper way to use the law today. The law will not produce the life of Christ in the believer. It won't do it. All it's going to do is show you that that's sin. And we'll see that as we go down through here. Notice... Verse, verse, verse 6, he says, But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead, wherein we were held. Now he's saying, we were dead. Here, back here, we were told that we, we died with Christ. Now it's something different. Notice, that being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So there's this law that's dealing with the flesh back there. Now you've got a newness of spirit and not the oldness of the letter. Do you know what he's talking about there? He's talking about go live based upon the grace that God's given you. All right? So you should automatically think, Brother, does that mean Romans chapter 5 where he talks about the fact that we have this grace wherein we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand? Absolutely, that's what it means. He's already told you about that. Romans chapter 5 comes before Romans chapter 7 and he tells us that we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Do you realize the moment that you get taken out of Adam, by the way, which is up here, and you're placed into Christ, that there is a transaction that takes place that nobody else can perform other than God Himself. God takes you out of Adam, places you into living union with Christ, takes you out of that flesh and says, you don't have to live based on that flesh, those emotions and the motion of sin, but you can live based on the Spirit, that newness of Spirit. And it's not the Spirit that, that a lot of folks, you know, they, they go over to Acts chapter 2 and they'll say, well, the Spirit fell on them and they were able to have that second blessing. It's not a second blessing. You get that the moment that you get saved. But notice, he says, he says what? We are to live based on the grace wherein we stand. How do you access that grace? By faith. What's faith? Believing what God says in His Word. Taking God at His Word. That's all faith is. We've said it before, faith isn't some unattainable thing that maybe, hopefully, one day you can just reach out and maybe get. No, it's something that all you do is just trust what God says. Believe these verses for yourself. Notice he continues on in verse 7, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? The answer is, God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Do you know what the law does? Now, to a saved person, it tells you that that's a sin. That's all it does. It reveals your sin. And that's what he's dealing with there. Verse 8, he says, But sin, taken occasion by the commandment, wrought in me of all manner of concupiscence, for without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Do you know what happens to a saved person? You come to the knowledge of the truth. You understand, or you, you, you come to an understanding of God's Word, right the divide, and you get saved based upon the gospel that you're supposed to be saved by, which is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, which is also found in, in, in Romans chapter 1, all the way through, technically, you could even say the entire book of Romans. But there's some things there that we need to know and understand that if we get saved by the right gospel, 
We know that we're a sinner. And then we get in and we start coming to the knowledge of the truth and we find out that, hey, this verse back over here says that this is sin. Notice what he says. For I was alive without the law once, but when the, sin, when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. You know what happens? You go back and you look at these things and you say, well, hey, that law back there says what I just did is a sin, but here's what's going on. If, if you do... He says, sin revived and I died. That's a functional death. Do you know, you know what the best part about this is? The fact that you're free from sin, you're free from the law. The law says this is a sin. And then what do you get to say? I don't do that anymore. I choose not to do that anymore. If you choose to do it again, what happens is sin revived and I died. He's talking about a saved individual here. He's talking about the fact that if I go and I go do these things, what's going to happen to me is I'm going to become functionally dead. I'm not going to be able to produce the works. The Spirit won't be able to produce those works in and through me. That fruit. So then we won't be able to function the way that we're supposed to function. Hold your place there. Go over real quick to the book of Timothy. Uh, let's go. Let's go. Second Timothy. Second Timothy, chapter two. Second Timothy, chapter two. Let's take a look at verse twenty-four. Now, there's some issues that we have to know and understand as we go through this life. If we sin, does that mean we lose our salvation? The answer is no. If you think that you doing something wrong gets you unsaved, then that means you really trusted in you doing something to get saved. Now a lot of people say, yeah, but that means I can go murder somebody. I don't know why that's the first response to people when you say you're saved all the time. Once saved, always saved, or whatever you want to call it. Once sealed, always sealed. Once in Christ, always in Christ. There's different ways you can say it. I don't know why people go to that one. But here's the issue. Yeah, you're still saved. Well, if you preach that, then I'm going to go live however I want to. Well, you did that before you got saved. You're going to do that in a, in a Baptist church or a Catholic church or a, you know, whatever, whatever church that you go to. You're going to do the exact same things because you think that these laws are going to be able to prevent you. The law will never prevent you from sinning. Ever. In fact, it's going to make things worse for you. In fact, what it's going to do is it's going to make you functionally dead. Notice, how do you get rid of it? Notice in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in all meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. That's the idea of being functionally dead opposing who you are, saying, I know I'm in grace, but I'm going to go back up here and I'm going to try and live based on the law. What's the law produce? Death. So if you go back here trying to live under the law, what are you going to do? You're going to be functionally dead. And you're not living, you're opposing who you are. If you are saved, if you're a saved individual, and you are saved by grace through faith, and that alone, God has placed you into living union with Christ, and you are to live based off of the Spirit, not by the flesh. You're supposed to live based on grace. And if that's going on in your life, then you're not opposing yourself. But if you go up here and say, well, now I've got to go get sanctified by, by producing the law. I've heard people say that. Your sanctification has absolutely nothing to do with the law at all. But it's allowing God's Word to work in and through you. And notice what he says, In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Now, you take that word repentance and a lot of people come along and they'll say, See, you've got to turn from sin. You know, it's not what it's talking about at all. You know the word repent never in your Bible has ever meant turn from sin. You know how I know? You go and study it out. See how many times God repented. Now you tell me what sin does He need to turn from? The answer is none. 
The problem is, is the definition's bad. The definition has to do with changing his mind. God, when he created man on the earth and he looks and sees man, he says it, it repented God that he made man on earth. And what did he do? He flooded it. There's not a, there's not a sin that he's, in, in, that he's under. It, he changed his mind. He said, man, I shouldn't have done this. It's not like he didn't know what was going to happen. He knew exactly what was going to happen. And so then, what he's looking at there is he's talking about repentance to the knowledge of the truth. Saying, I am wrong. I can't do this. So I'm going to go back living under grace. And that's what repentance is. It's changing your mind. I can't be made perfect by the law, but I am made perfect in grace. And knowing that, and understanding that, Verse 26, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. You realize when you get caught up in a sin and you become functionally dead, the way that you recover yourself is, go over to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. He says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Those are the four things. Doctrine. What you're taught. There's sound doctrine. We talked about that a moment ago. The sound doctrine is what was get that grace of God that was given to Paul. And he says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. For reproof. Do you know what reproof is? Reproof is doctrine about how your behavior needs to change. And by the way, he doesn't give you a law to do it. He gives you grace to do it. Correction. Do you know what correction is? It's doctrine on how to fix your bad doctrine. The instruction in righteousness, that's just the, the teachings that allows you to know that you can live based upon the righteousness that you now own as a present personal possession. Why is that important? Verse 17. That, here's the purpose. That the man of God may be perfect... Now, perfect there doesn't mean sinless perfection. He tells us right here what perfect is. Perfect, which means what? Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Do you realize that in grace, we have been completely and totally equipped with doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness that we may be perfect, thoroughly furnished. You lack nothing to be furnished unto all good works. Which means we don't have to go back here. The law was, the law was good. The problem was is it showed man his sinfulness. So, we're saved by grace through faith. That doesn't mean we go back to the law. In fact, that's what Romans chapter 7 is dealing with. The fact that we are free from the law. Go back to Romans chapter 7. So when you've got folks that come along and say... You know, we're going to save you. We're going to give you the gospel to get you saved by grace through faith and that alone. And then you say, praise the Lord, amen. Now what do I need to do? Well, um, go live the Ten Commandments. Oh yeah, by the way, come and give us 10% of all your earnings. Gross or net? Mm, let's make it gross because it will be more. That's not, that's, not what, that's not what the church is supposed to be about. The church is to be the ground and the pillar of the truth. We're to hold forth the word of life. That people can know this is the place to come to if you want to find out what God's word actually says. Now, we say a lot of bold things here. And it's not to, it's not to make you all, oh, I can't believe they said that. We want you to know what the book actually says. Not what we think it says. And so we are to be the pillar on the ground of the truth. We're not supposed to be a, a, a nightclub during the day on Sundays. That's not our job. As the church, that's not our job. 
Our job is to bring forth the word of life so that you know that you have salvation and that you know you can actually live a life. One of the things we have at the very beginning of this TV program is there's a gospel that you can believe, a Bible you can trust, a life that you can live, and it has absolutely nothing to do with that law. It has absolutely nothing to do with entertainment value. It has absolutely nothing to do with clubs and, and participation of that. It has nothing to do about little groups. All it has to do with is people caring about the book to get in it and then take that information out to the world. And you might look a little bit different than everybody else, and that's okay. But we see here in Romans chapter 7, he says what? Verse, verse, verse 9, he says, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin, sin revived and I died, and the commandment which is ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin taken occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. Do you know what sin's going to do? Sin will deceive you. And it will make you think, I'm doing something good. Look at me, world. I go to church every Sunday morning. I am keeping the, the Sabbath. Look at me. Look at what I'm doing. I don't, I don't do these things, and I don't do these things, and I don't do this, and I don't do that. And the, the law, what it does is it deceives you into thinking that you're doing good by keeping the commandments. And do you know what the law is actually doing? We're going to have to stop there for today. And I hate to stop in the middle of that. But keep that in mind. We'll talk about that, that question in the next time. The last little bit here, what I want to do is, is offer you this, this book. It's called Dictionary of the Gospel. Absolutely free of charge. doesn't cost you anything at all. In fact, we've mentioned before, if you send us money, we'll, we'll send it back to you. Uh, that's not our purpose here. What we want to do is get this book in as many homes as we possibly can so that this book would challenge you to get into the Scriptures, the Bible, King James Bible, which is really the big issue. Now, this is just the conduit to get you there. But the King James Bible is the issue, and we're hoping that that will help get you into that Bible. We do, we do thank you for taking time out of your life to join us each and every time that you do. Our hope and prayer is that you come to the knowledge of the truth for those that are saved. And if you're not saved, they actually hear the gospel and trust in that and that alone. And we thank you. And until next time, grace and peace.